Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. As we discussed, we have a special guest who came on our podcast. If, if those of you who've been with us since the beginning, we're a member uh, almost a year ago in November, uh, my dear brother came on and shared some very, very valuable information. I've asked him to come back on again for a reprise because of the urgency of where we are globally with the Global Reset, and he has been gracious enough to uh, join us. So strap in, get comfortable, get some drinks. This is going to take a while because we have a lot to go through. But we have our returning friend and brother B, who, as you may recall, works for one of the largest and most widely known financial institutions throughout the world. And he's sticking his neck out literally to do this for us. So we're going to be providing for you a broad scope of information, primarily focusing on where we're going as he believes in his forecasting over the next five years. And yes, short term with the currencies and cryptos, we have some information to share that I'm gonna share with you during the, pro the podcast. I think you're gonna like in, in a lot of ways. And I shared it, it actually came from one of our team members. I shared it with some other team members and they absolutely loved it. We believe you will as well. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna go through some things now. Full disclosure, as I told you folks on last week's weekly wrap up, I don't want my friend to hear this, that, um, Full disclosure of humility, we, we give credit where it is due, and when we are wrong, we are not too proud to admit that. As we know, the Bible says pride goes before a fall. So he was right, I was wrong. Now, I didn't want him to be right. He knows that from an emotional standpoint. None of us wanted to wait this long. Everyone here wanted this to happen a year, two years, five years, 10 years. That's understandable, and that's a given. But throughout our lives, you all know in your own personal walks, there are experiences and knowledge and things that are required over time that we have to realize. And as we look back in retrospect, we realize if it happened at that time, something else would have gone wrong. We would have had a pitfall. We wouldn't have had vital information that we needed that we now know at that point to cross that bridge. And we're better off that it happened the way it is. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy to wait. I'm not saying it's fun. That's all a given. But we're here now. Let's celebrate that we're here. We made it. And we're going to cross this finish line, as we always say, together and be as helping as part of the instrumental team to help us get over the finish line. Now, the good news is, is what he's going to share will show you that we are now in that season of the bust right now coming into what we call the fourth quarter, October through December. But also uh, it's the new fiscal calendar year financially starting, I believe it's September 30th, October 1st. Uh, the calendar is very different this year. Um, a lot of things with holidays and daylight savings time and all that, because we're going through a time transition. So <clears throat> don't be scared. Don't react to what you're going to hear. If you think it's negative, we are going to clarify each and every seminal point that he's going to bring up. Okay. So I'm going to uh, put up a slide to accompany B here and also um, welcome him to the podcast. B, thank you for being here. How are you doing today? Um, I'm doing great, John. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, brother. You, thanks for everything you've done all these years. So um, before we get started with our talk track, I've put up the slide, which I think you and the audience can see here. Uh, I'll see if I can expand it a little bit, see if I can bump it up a little so that uh, it's, it's a little bit clearer there. Um, so if you would do me a favor, just kindly talk about a little articulation on each of the points that you're going to bring up, and then we can get started if that's okay with you. Oh, you bet. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure. And um, anyway, though, I, I, I guess the first thing I wanted to mention is, or, or ask you is, does this slide look familiar? It, indeed it does. It was from last year. That's exactly right. This is the same slide that I had uh, in our last interview. And uh, I was going to change it up, but uh, I didn't really need to. Nothing has really changed. My forecast is exactly the same. We are just a little further down the road on how it's all playing. Sure. Um, you... Sorry to interrupt, B. Can you? Oh, that's uh, okay. You're muted. You're kind of muffled a little bit on the sound. I know people know. Can you uh, turn up the mic or speak a little closer to it, please, just so we can hear you? Um. Sure. Thanks. Um, is that better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you start again with what you're saying, please? Uh, um, do you want me to start right at the beginning? Uh, you can just start from the slide, like the fact that it looks exactly the same as last year. That's fine. Okay. So um, uh, I was going to change it up. 
but I really don't need to. Nothing really changed. Uh, my forecast is exactly the same. We are just a little further down the road on how it's going to play out. Everything we discussed before is still the same. Hopefully we can go into more detail about it. Sure, well, maybe, maybe B, you could start by kind of giving us an overview of where we are currently and refresh everyone about what the melt up and the bust and the eventual collapse apps actually mean from a terminology or technical standpoint. Sure, I'd love to do that. Uh, but before I do, I need to give my uh, standard disclaimer. Nothing I'm about to say is investing advice and nothing to do with the company that I work for and currently employed. What you're about to hear is my personal uh, view based on my own personal research for the people that I believe in and follow. And with that out of the way, let's recap what's going on uh, when you last interviewed me. If you remember, the market sentiment was very negative while I was talking about the market melt up, uh, all the experts were predicting a crash. Since November, the S&P has rallied from about 4140 to an all-time high of 5700. And I think it's a little even a little bit higher today. The Dow was some five. And then, Sorry, you're breaking up, B. Can you say it again? Uh, the Dow was uh, 32,500. Mm -hmm. And now is sitting around 42,400. So it's almost a 10,000 point increase. The NASDAQ is sitting at 14,200 and uh, was, you know, was sitting at 14,200 and recently went over 20,000. Gold was around $1,785 at that time. And now it's over 2,600. And it looks like it's well on its way to 27. Mm -hmm. Silver was at uh, 22, around 2275, and now it's over $32. Right, right. And so, B, was this the blow off top that you were discussing back when we last spoke? Has the melt up happened since then? Well, actually, even after the market has rallied to near all time over the course of the last. I believe we're still in the melt up phase. Sorry, B, you're, you're breaking up again. I'm sorry, can you, can you start again? Sure. Thanks. Um, actually, after the market has rallied to near all time highs mm -hmm. over the course of the last 10 months, I believe we are still in the melt up phase. And I believe the last portion is yet to come. Okay. I don't think we've reached the parabolic part in the melt up where the market goes completely ballistic. Yeah, we've had quite a run, um, <clears throat> specifically with the S&P hitting all time highs. And I wanna ask you about that for the audience because most people see that. I mean, some people know, but some people don't know, of course, because everybody's at a different place. Um, why is that number so significant for you? And how high do you think it can actually go? Well, um, my target, on the S&P is still 7,000, uh, which is almost a 40% raise from where we are today. And what's even more crazy is that at 7,000, I mm -hmm. mean, that could be very well be on the low side when it's all said and done. Okay, and why, why is the S&P so significant in your eyes to be paying attention to that? I just think it's the main index that you know, it, it has the, you know, the best stocks or, you know, all of the stocks that basically translate to the economy of the U.S. and, uh, you know, the way it's weighted. And um, to me, that's, I don't know, when that gets to the certain point, that's going to be the really the, the key um, to signify um, you know, the top of the melt up in, in my estimation. Okay. So, so with, with the S and P going to 7,000, like you said, is, is unprecedented. And we're seeing a lot of things obviously in the world and in the financial world specifically 
that have never happened before they're going to happen right we'll talk about that also extenuated throughout the this discussion but how can this happen be where's all this money coming from well that's a good question john uh, a lot of the money was printed during covid last night i was watching a youtube video sorry you're, you're breaking up again b okay last night i was watching a youtube video featuring chan lin and he had a slide that showed there were, is currently close to six trillion dollars in money market funds. There's a lot of investment from abroad. These economies and stock markets aren't doing as well as our as our own. Uh, Europe and hedge funds and slowly making its way back into the market and. Uh, I believe that's going to ramp up in kind of a FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. So in reality, there's a there's an incredible available fund that can still be invested, and for many other sources. So, um, animal, I believe that there's you know, you're. I'm sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but <clears throat> you keep fading in and out your sound. It's very hard to hear every other word. So, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I am, I'm not sure what the problem is. Um, I'm just, I'm here in front of my computer. Uh, okay. So we're having some technical issues, folks. Sorry about that. Obviously, we have no control of that. But um, B was saying that uh, they're making, uh, money is making its way back in the stock, stock market and ramp up, by, ramp up by fear of missing out. And then B, you can continue from there, please. Uh, sure. Uh, so in reality, there's still an incredible amount of available funds that can be invested and from many other sources. So um, bottom line, I believe there's enough liquidity out there to really keep the market continually moving to all time highs. And this is what happens when a secular bull market completes. It doesn't end with a whimper. It generally ends in a shooting star, supernova, melt up explosion, and that's what I believe will happen this time as well. So when do you anticipate be this will happen? And, and when will this melt up reach its you know, crescendo or climax point? Well, if you uh, reviewed our interview last year, uh, I was predicting late first quarter or early second quarter of 2024. But like I told everyone back then as well, this is just a forecast. There really isn't a time frame wrapped around a forecast. It's going to play out. I mean, is it going to play out? Uh, I believe so, but I can't give, give you the exact day that's going to happen. Yeah, of course. And you know, we don't we don't do dates, rates here. We do puzzle pieces of events, which obviously you're helping in a contributory fashion. And that was actually going to be my next question. When do you think this melt up will complete? Again, understanding that you can't give a precise or exact timing, but can you maybe narrow down the scope of the of the framework of the timing? Sure. Um, well, like I mentioned before, I believe we are currently in the melt up, and we are just waiting for that last parabolic stage to play out. Having the Fed cut the rates by fifty basis basis points recently is a tailwind. I believe the dollar will begin to weaken, which will also help. My target on the Dixie or the dollar index is 80, mm -hmm. and we are currently around uh, 100. And uh, after listening to the Peter Schiff interview, uh, I believe that's that's his target as well. Uh, if I were a betting man, I, I could see the melts up completely playing out uh, before the election or the end of the year, if that helps. Absolutely. And that, that actually aligns with what I believe is going to happen too. B. So let's assume that that's the case. Then what? Well, uh, I think there's a few different outcomes possible from the experts I follow. Uh, one school of thought is that it plays out much like the 2001 dot com demise, where tech went down about 80%. Uh, the value of stocks fared a little better. Uh, this scenario makes sense, I think because of the numbers and the way that the market market is positioned with tech and AI related stocks reaching um, nosebleed level PE ratios. There is also the hope of a soft landing generated by the Fed. 
Uh, that scenario has a very small chance of happening, in my opinion. And one of the experts I happen to believe in is predicting an 80% bust in the stock market, uh, a global deflationary bust, meaning it will seem like a depression, but it won't last quite as long. Did you? I'm sorry, did you say an 80% bust in the stock market? No, that's what I, I believe, yes. Okay, so are you saying... Uh, a global def deflationary bust. I mean, what is that? All that I've heard the last several years is that inflation is going to be the main thing we have to be concerned with. Yeah, uh, a global uh, deflationary bust is a period of falling price or deflation, and that can lead to a vicious cycle of economic. Um, Sorry, you're, you're you're cutting out again. Be a little bit okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me let me rephrase that again. Uh, please, please. A, glo uh, a global deflationary bust is a period of falling prices or deflation that can lead to a vicious cycle of economic decline. And I think this one will start similarly, like the like the one in 1929, which was the Great Depression, where excessive speculation in the stock market led to it being overvalued and then it was followed by panic selling <clears throat> so what happens really is there's kind of a run on the bank more or less people institutions don't have the capital or just a fraction of it everyone begins to get, begin selling trying to get out of their positions stock prices are plummeting leveraged positions are getting margin calls and then it becomes one vicious circle Everyone wants to get out, but there are no buyers. Liquidity, liquidity in the market uh, seizes up and everything begins to implode. You've probably seen movies where people are searching uh, or standing in line trying to get or go to the store. And uh, you Sorry, know, back you, in the- you broke up again, B, uh, you're uh, talking uh, about the, the movies again. What was that? Yeah, yeah, you've probably seen movies where people are standing in line and they're trying to get the money from the bank before it goes under. Uh, you know, back in the Great Depression, there was no FDIC. So, uh, you know, people were hiding what little money they had under their mattress or a hole they had dug in their backyard. Banks were closing. People were jumping out of windows. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's kind of a slow train wreck. And um, a normal depression could last many years, even though it started with the stock market. It's really more of a symptom of the global economy as a whole. You know, falling prices, lower production, which then leads to lower wages and demand, which in turn leads to further price increases. Wages and prices fall. The value of debt remains the same, making it more difficult for debtors to repay their loans. You know, massive layoffs. Like I said before, people hoard money instead of spending it. And I believe this is the scenario that's going to pass off in the first quarter of 2025. And I think it's going to last for about a year. You know, but who knows? The mail took on the bus might take a little longer to play out. And there's always the chance of some black swan flying in and derailing the whole forecast. So What's what's going to happen during this bust? Will will the dollar be dethroned eventually as the global currency, and at some point will gold emerge as the new standard? Well, speaking of gold, I didn't mention it before, but uh, during the melt up, my forecast is three thousand plus. You know, I'm thinking it might get all the way up to thirty four hundred. Mm -hmm. Silver seventy five, and despite what the bricks are doing, my forecast during the bust is that almost all asset classes will go down in value. And that that's even including gold and silver. Precious metals could get close to the price they are right now, even after the big run-up. Oil down to $30 a barrel. I'm sorry, you're breaking up again. What was that about oil? Um, oil down to 30 per, uh, $30 a barrel. Okay. And uh, real estate could drop to uh, uh, drop 30%. And I know your prediction on real estate is uh, around 80%, maybe even higher. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say that it was in the 90s that you're, well, you're predicting? I believe 80 to 90%. When we talked to Lynette Zhang uh, a 
couple months or six weeks ago, we, we'll, we'll have her on in October again to clarify. Uh, she was saying she believes it could be up to 95% with cash on hand because those of us who are obviously in this global reset you know, set of, of godly currencies and bonds and cryptos and metals and all the, all the other mechanisms um, will have the kingdom money to be able to, to buy up things like real estate at cheap prices. Like you said, only people who have the money will be able to do that, which puts us in a very, as you know, advantageous position. But yeah, up to 95% was her prediction. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty dire. And um, anyway, to continue on, unlike the 29, 1929 depression, um, th I believe this one will be a little bit different. The central banks across the globe will have to print massive amounts of currency to pump liquidity back into the system. Now, remember back in 1929, uh, we were still on the gold standard mm -hmm. and we were not able to turn on the printing press like we can today. Uh, but I believe the Fed will have to print about 30 trillion, if you can believe it, or more to save the system. And that's just in the US, uh, you know, other central banks around the world will be doing the same thing. And despite what you think, I believe the world, could, uh, the world will be flocking to the safety of the dollar and treasuries. And those could be the only assets that do well during this bust. And so you're thinking the bust will start in the first quarter of 2025. So what should people do in the meantime to protect themselves? Well, as you know, I can't offer any trading advice, but like I said, I think treasuries and the dollar are going to hold up pretty well. So maybe this, and you know, I mean, here's another idea, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe the simplest way not to get run over by this oncoming train would be being cash and just step aside. Maybe the best advice is not being invested in, in anything during this. I mean, it's probably gonna be hard to stomach. Sorry, you're breaking up again, B. Okay. Okay, um, so um, it's probably gonna be hard to stomach, but while the bust is transpiring, um, but I think after the precious metals get whacked, um, like everything else, gold and silver will probably be some of the first assets, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. to come back. So you may want to consider owning these, even with the knowledge they won't be completely immune uh, during the bust, or at least initially. Okay. Now, I know you probably want me to provide some information on crypto and currencies during this time frame, but that's really not my expertise. So I'm going to leave it to you <clears throat> to provide some insight uh, to your listeners on that front. <clears throat> sure, no problem. And um, thank you for that and uh, for the information thus far. Yeah, we're, we're really excited on our side, as you know, be about the BRICS Nations Conference, as well as this, uh, the UN General Assembly meetings. Normally, you know, as it's a cabal setup, we we could care less. But this year, actually, I would say last year, around the time you and I did our podcast, you know, dovetailing into almost a year later, we started to get very interested last year about <clears throat> once Prime Minister Sudani, for example, in Iraq, was speaking at the G UN General Assembly conference, uh, because we were thinking he was going to hint last year at coming back onto the international stage for the dinar. It turns out that a couple of days ago, and we're going to get that video when it becomes available, and we'll share it on our Telegram. I mean, probably our YouTube as well, and all the channels for that matter, so people can see a wide net of him saying that Iraq is open for business um, internationally, which is basically his way of saying they're coming back on the international stage, uh, that they're doing the reforms, they're removing the currency auctions because the banks, the U.S. banks are, as you may know, are all involved in daily currency auctions, which is nothing more than money laundering. Uh, so that's a program rate and not the true rate, which is in the private sector, the Ministry of Planning, which most of our audience knows. We're excited about seeing the gold and silver prices going up as we believe strongly that's the backbone of the new financial system. And to drive that point home, uh, B, I'm gonna show you and our audience a slide right now, a screen share, which we're pretty darn excited about. As you know, this just came out from one of our team members, John G found credit for the fine on this. this. This dovetails into the subject of cryptos quite nicely, which everyone knows, well, XRP. And you can see right here, I'm showing you transparently on Crypto News Flash. Um, we are meeting with Lynette 
as you know, mm-hmm. next month. And one of her holdups has been is that she has not been able to find any tangible evidence that XRP was a provable uh, tokenized asset commodity uh, to be used as a form of payment. She couldn't prove it out, in other words. We were searching. Again, John found it this morning and shared it with me and all, all credit goes to him once again. So I'm gonna be sharing this with her team prior to the podcast so that she's not ambushed. But this article clearly proves um, several weeks ago, B, as you may know, and most of our audience may know, India um, did their first crude oil transaction bypassing the dollar using the petro yuan, but they needed a mechanism or a middleman to make that conversion. They used right here, the transaction was integrated with the XRP ledger system crypto trading fund, CTF, thereby enabling customers to earn tokens as cashback. So XRP did the first non-dollar transaction between ostensibly BRICS nations using uh, the Petro one, because, because we know that the Prince Ben Salman uh, in June 6th of this year did not renew the Petro dollar agreement. So this is a massive, as you know, switch and a massive shift. So we're, we're quite excited about uh, the direction of where things are going. And this is one of the first articles we can see that proves out and actually came out, like you said, August 12th here. We, we just didn't find it till recently because just, a lot of these articles can get kind of buried in the background. They get hard to find. This, this stuff is not as easy, folks, as you can see. But I'm just scrolling down so you can see the article. So it's our strong contention, B, with this article in mind and for the audience, that what we see happening, to your point, is we believe, and, and I got this sort of download in my mind the other day, as I told you offline, mm-hmm. from, from the recent interview we had with Peter Schiff. He believes, as you know, that I asked him, do you think the BRICS conference is going to be where they're going to ditch the dollar formally to the world and you know, go into the safety of their own countries, nationalize them, powering up in, in gold and silver and revaluing their currencies and, and using you know, cryptos? And he felt candidly that they would not need to do that, that they would do it more clandestine or surreptitiously. Based on how hard it was to find this article, I started to think, Maybe this week, the UN General Assembly is where each country is going to do that because the UN is the place where you get the, to this point, the widest traction to the world. The US sees it, the entire world sees it. You see Modi meeting with um, you know, Vietnam's prime minister. They're all getting their deals together. It's like a test run for you know, the BRICS in October. And so each nation is individually standing up on that pulpit before the world saying what they're saying, that they're nationalizing, they're breaking free, they're, they're powering up their country. They're getting a sense of nationalism. These are all codes for what we're waiting on. And so I started to think that he might be right that come October, it won't be necessary. They can just do it because they have um, predictive programming where they told the world, hey, this is what we're doing. And the world just isn't paying attention and thinks it's just another self-serving conference. It's business as usual. When in actuality, what they did was, was disclaim what they're going to do. And just nobody took them seriously because our corrupt U.S. cabal government is basically daring Iraq to do it, but you can see Sudani is removing the troops. He's digitizing their, their financial system. He's putting in their reforms. He's, um, he's in New York. He's just told the world, like I said. So he, he's going full steam ahead. So uh, we're, we're quite excited with, with the speed of which you know, things are occurring. So um, that's kind of my little two cents for what it's worth. Um, so with that in mind, do you think after the bust of the dollar, it'll be replaced by another gold-backed currency? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't think so, John. Hmm. Um, like it or not, I think the dollar will be with us for a few more years, despite that, re- the, you know, the, re- the recent revelation with XRP. Um, but I think um, you know during the bust, you may see the Fed trying to institute a CBDC. I think you'll see him pull out all the stops. Uh, besides printing tons of money to save the system, you may see the Fed and Treasury send out incentive checks, uh, you know, to people and businesses, in an attempt to get the economy going again, much like they did during COVID. So I need to, before we go forward, B, I want to, this is a very important point that you just made. And I, and I know the audience is kind of, I can imagine the audience is kind of like, wait, what? So this sounds like a bad thing, folks, but I'll tell you why we don't think it is. And I know B, you're going to elaborate that on, a set, on that in a second. 
many of you have asked us over time in, in the comment sections of these different podcasts, hey, you know, when I go to exchange at the bank, should I exchange in dollars or in gold or something else? Um, from what I'm gathering, B, it sounds like you're thinking that even though the dollar index is going to weaken, which it has to, which you've established, Peter Schiff's even established it. He even said next year it's going to go down to 50 or 40, which, as you know, is a dramatic drop. We don't even need the dollar index. I think you would agree to go that low to see a reset. We can do it on 80 alone, right? And so um, it's, it's, it's good in the standpoint, folks, that the dollar index will go down, come off the dance floor for these other currencies to come up. But what that means is, if I'm understanding you, Brooke, that be that that um, that the currency the when people go to exchange their currencies or or cryptos whatever they can actually do it in physical dollars and then move it into hard assets or other currencies or whatever they want to do they'll still have some element of purchasing power in the meantime does that sound about right yeah yeah that sounds uh, that sounds right John yeah I believe that the the dollar will be viable for. Um, I'm thinking the next five to eight years. Um, hmm. You know, it's it, it's been around for a long time, and I think it's going to um, still, um, you know, still, you know, still be around for uh, for a while. So, so with that in mind, if if they do try to do basically what I'm hearing you say, stimulus, um, you know, that sort of thing. To, to give the, the economy the illusion of you know, pulling it back up again. Of course, lowering rates gives that illusion, but what it really does is, you know, it just weakens the dollar further. Um, so you kind of have like these inverse moves happening. Um, if they do try to issue a CBDC, do you see it working? Because I know that Canada just said a week ago, they're not going to issue CBDC. So what's your, what's your take on that? Um. Sorry, well, I really, yeah, I really don't. I, I don't see uh, the CBDC working. They've tried it in other countries like China, and it didn't work there. I mean, it may work for a brief period. Um, you know, it'll be another incentive during the bust for people that are in debt or struggling. Um, perhaps the government will eliminate their debt, you know, people's debt, if they agree to convert over to a CBDC. And, uh, you know, this would be the optimum time for the government who wants to control every aspect of our lives to introduce a CBDC and get people on it while they're scared or they're on the verge of bankruptcy, you know, and try to get them to the bank. Um, but like I said before, I think it's only going to work for a brief time if it is instituted. Um, even with the CBDC, it, it doesn't change the fact that we're, you know, $35 trillion in debt, you know, as a country. Mm -hmm. And by the time the bust is over, I mean, we could be in debt double that amount. So, and and on the horizon there, we've still got the, you know, 250 trillion in derivatives that are waiting to implode. So the debt isn't going to go away with the CBDCs. It's just really I'm sorry, the debt isn't going to go away in what? I lost you there. Yeah, the, you know, the debt's not going to go away. Uh, you know, with the CBDC, it's merely transformed uh, to a digital ledger that the Fed will now control. And once we get to the end of the decade, my prediction is, is that we're going to have high inflation. Um, still, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I lost you. Uh, what did you say at the, the debt? We're going to have what now? Um, you know, once we get to the, um, you know, the end of the decade, my prediction is that we're going to have high inflation mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the inflation that we had, you know, that 9%, you, know, you think that's bad that we had last year, you know, wait till it's 25%. Right. And at that point, we're not going to be able to, you know, pay down the debt or print our way out of it. And so, um, you know, the, after, you know, at that point, our 50 year Ponzi scheme eventually ends and implodes. So, Again, even they, if they do institute a CBDC, um, it, it's it's really not going to change, you know, how much debt that we have. And so, again, I just don't see it working out uh, in the end. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I think it all points, all roads point B to the reset. There, there's no way to save it. They're going to just have to reset it, and we get kind of 
first crack at getting through the system, again, becoming our own central bank, right? Like you're doing, I'm doing, everyone that we encourage to do the same. So that no matter what that does or doesn't do, it, it doesn't really effectuate people because they've, they've been given a, a Red Sea moment to get through the other side because there is no saving it. I, I totally agree. So <clears throat> we know that our money will eventually be no good and that the dollar-based debt system is going to collapse. Um, again, not financial advice, but from your statistical financial purview, um, what is the best thing that you recommend people do to prepare? Well, the first thing, um, you know, I want to say is, uh, you know, just like you mentioned, uh, the monetary and support system that we've grown up with and are used to and really have counted on for all our lives may not exist. I mean, just, I just think having, being cognizant of that, I think is, is something that people should contemplate. And, uh, you know, what does that mean? Well, for one, if the dollar loses its global fiat status, uh, by the way, the Brits or something else, um, or eventually defaults, it means that our government, the money, has to be in kind of money. Sorry, you're breaking up again. Uh, um, it means that our government will not have the money to pay for the entitlements that we're, uh, we were counting on. And uh, so, you know, prepare for no social security, uh, no welfare, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the other government programs. Mm -hmm. So that, to, to me, you know, like a lot of people are, you know, they're putting money away in their 401ks and, and you know, pensions and stuff like that. So, uh, and that's kind of a scary thought. To think that any government assistance could be, could be gone, which I think it will be. Mm -hmm. And you know, even though we haven't defaulted yet, uh, you know, the dollar may be so worthless that even if they do pay you, like a social security check, it may it may not buy you anything or very little. So again, think in terms of the monetary system not being around to depend on. Now, the nice thing is, is we do have a little time. We have a few years to get our the nice thing house. is, nice thing is what? I'm sorry, you said again. Um, the nice thing is, is that we do have a little time. Uh, we have a few years to get our fiscal house in order. Those with little or no debt will be in a better position to weather the storm. Since Richard Nixon eliminated the gold standard in August of 1971, the past 43 years, um, the paper market flourished because of declining interest rates. This includes the dollar, bonds, stocks, treasuries. But I think in the next 50 years, uh, it'll all be about hard assets, commodities, precious metals, oil, real estate, et cetera. So if we make it through the bust and we have a little cash left over, uh, commodities might be a good place to put some money to work. Yep. I, um, uh, to give you an example, my target for, for gold at the end of the decade is 20,000. And I think your prediction may be even be greater than that. Yeah, yeah. Sil silver at 400. Uh, an ounce, a uh, barrel of oil, 500. And so I, I think you're, well, I mean, you know, you have a level of statistical analysis which you do every day that we don't. So it's not so much a right or wrong thing because, you know, like, like uh, Bill Holter said on our last podcast, you don't have a numerator and you don't have a denominator. So until we audit the Fed, which we know they don't have the gold in Fort Knox. It's in many other places in the country, like Bixware says in the Grand Canyon and all that kind of stuff. We don't really know how much gold we really have in America. Um, and we know they're not telling us anything resembling the truth, right? When we look at the unemployment numbers, look at the, uh, the, the inflation on the dollar, which is ostensibly, ostensibly a tax. It's costing you more to buy food and groceries and car insurance and homeowners insurance and HOAs and all that stuff. So uh, it's really hard to get a, a full handle. But to his point, he believes the true debt is around, two, you know, somewhere between two and 300 trillion. And it would take it, gold and silver would have to be in the six figures to, you know, get rid of that debt. Uh, since we're going to default on that, as I, I agree, and I think you agree, obviously you said it earlier, we don't need to worry about, be concerned about that. Uh, but I do think that um, for that reason, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. That's why I think we're 
we're probably going to see gold somewhere in 40, 50, 60,000 an ounce. And silver, I believe, has the potential to be worth even more because of its uses in manufacturing, AI robotics in the new digital age, right? Um, it's in solar panels. <laughs> so it's in everything. People just don't, don't realize that. Um, but this does address nicely, B, thank you for that, as to whether people um, should buy precious metals and to what extent over what you know, period of time, they got kind of a window, uh, you know, I would say what, you know, two to three years, maybe more to kind of transition into precious metals if they haven't done so already. And also, again, to redress the point that they, they do have time to divest in dollars uh, to then move into other positions vis-a-vis -vis more current foreign currencies as these foreign currencies revalue, uh, gold and silver, as we mentioned, cryptos, right, land, food, water source, whatever. Um, and I also want to encourage to the elderly audience, don't assume that you're, for lack of a better term, screwed, because you're not. Um, there are a lot of us in this kingdom community that are going to have already have plans, whether you call them kingdom or humanitarian projects, whatever you like to call them, that are going to help you. But here's a simple, practical thing, just, just my humble opinion, can take it or leave it, but you want to be solution-oriented, everyone, especially the older population. Um, if you have, for an, it's a very simple, practical thing you can do, by the way, all of us can do it. If you have a smoking habit, if you have a drinking habit, if you have a gambling habit, and it doesn't have to be Vegas, it could be going to get lottery tickets. We know a lot of people who buy five, 10, $20 or more a week in lottery tickets. The, if you go to coffee every day at, uh, you know, 7-Eleven, Starbucks, whatever, um, you know, Dunkin' Donuts for these coasters, uh, cut back. Or eliminate, if you can, wholesale some of those uh, extra uh, expenses. And you might find that you can save $25 or more a week, which could equate to $100 a month. You could get a couple ounces of silver and get some crypto and get yourself right into this game very quickly and then go from a disadvantaged position to an advantageous position in a very simple way. Or, again, as we've said on other podcasts, if you have friends who have precious metals in abundance, or they have cryptos in abundance, and they understand it better than you. When you have, you know, you can build things, you can sew, you can knit, uh, maybe you have some younger people in the neighborhood who might seek your advice about, you know, how to live a better life, you can consult for that, and they might pay you in crypto, you just got to get creative, is what I'm saying, there, there are solutions, um, you just have to think out of the box. And so hopefully, some of those suggestions help you a little bit. So sort of a slam dunk question B for you is if you had to pick one thing to invest in the next five years, what would it be? Yeah, it would be gold and silver. Right. But why just gold and silver? Well, um, in January of 2023, the central bank for all central banks in the world came out with Basel three and uh, it put gold as a tier one legal asset in the global, uh, global banking system. And so now there's three legal assets, one. Sorry, you broke up again. Yeah, uh, there's three legal assets, tier one, cash, mm -hmm. sovereign bonds, and now gold. So I think gold is where, uh, you know, price is um, and uh, I fear that gold will be the only tier one asset of these three left after the global default because everything else is, you know, basically paper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, central banks know this, and that's why they've been buying record amounts of gold since this was announced. Um, and everyone knows the dollar's on the decline. The U.S. government has debased it and weaponized it. Uh, countries around the world are trying to get rid of it. And, and silver, you know, there's many reasons to buy silver, I think. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned a lot of those. Uh, we've discussed it. Uh, uh, you know, offline, we both feel silver is a lot more scarce than what is known to the public. Like you mentioned, there's industrial uses and solar panels. The military uses a lot of silver, electronics, batteries, uh, you know, make it a very important uh, metal going forward. And, and it's also a monetary metal. And uh, I feel it's important that your listeners know that they should, should own the physical metal. Uh, I don't think they should, um, you know, own it is in a gold or silver ETF or exchange traded fund. 
Right. And, and, I, and I'd also uh, recommend paying in cash so that the government or anyone else uh, doesn't know you have it and can track it. Um, you know, there are some coin dealers that just, you know, they'll only accept cash. And uh, again, you know, you probably don't want to store it in a safety deposit box at the bank or, or vault it, uh, you know, put it in a vault somewhere. It needs to be in a place that you can readily access it. And that's just my opinion. I agree. Obviously, I've been saying that to our audience for years. If you don't touch it, you don't own it. Uh, have it in a, a, a personal safe or someplace where only you know where it is. Um, you know, have a mixture of, you know, junk silver and, you know, gold, uh, well, gold and silver coins, bars. Uh, and, and the way my brain works is I think of the, the junk silver as your, your everyday purchases. Your uh, coins are barterability, right? You know, eventually food and clothes. And at some point, I would think cars and even homes, especially with gold, um, because the price is going to come down, as we mentioned, significantly here shortly, just like it did, as you'll recall, uh, in the 2008 uh, bailout in the first quarter of 2009, we saw houses go down dramatically. And I think we're going to see it on an even larger scale this time around, as I'm sure you would agree. So, you know, having physical ownership of that. So the coins, our, our barability and then the bars, meaning anything I think over 10 ounces, 50 ounces, 100, whatever, that, that's your wealth preservation. That's at least how my brain sort of categorically organizes and structures it. Uh, so do you have any other recommendations, not to be redundant, but just to be thorough for our listeners as to what they should be doing now and in the years to come in order to prepare for the tr uh, changes and tribulations that are, are ahead of us? Uh, yeah. Um, again, I thought that sorry, you're breaking up. Yeah. Um, and just to let everybody know, my forecast isn't to scare anyone. You know, even though it does sound pretty awful now, um, but it's to make people cognizant of what is coming. And and again, I, I offer a few uh, a few ways to prepare. Um, if you know winter's coming, and you know that knowledge may be unpleasant, but at least you can buy yourself a coat and try to keep warm while it's going on. So but rather than looking at the end of the decade, uh, maybe concentrate on doing something that's uh, positive today. I mean, you mentioned, it. you know, cutting, you know, uh, maybe not buying that cup of coffee, um, you know, buying a lottery ticket, um, you know, putting a, some extra money towards a bill uh, or buy a buy a thing. You know, and even though, even if it's just a small amount, at least, like you said, you're making progress uh, towards being better prepared. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you you know, doesn't take much to be right back in the game. Uh, investing in some physical things may be a good start. Um, Sorry, you're to, you're, you were fading out again. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what's wrong with the uh, with the sound. Uh, investing in some physical gold and silver may be a good start. According to gold analyst uh, Alistair McLeod, mm -hmm. uh, one gold coin, just one gold coin, could buy a swanky six-bedroom mansion in Berlin during the hyperinflation of the 1923 Weimar Germany. And this was a time when the German people were burning Reichsmarks or money for warmth in their fireplace and carrying wheelbarrows of cash to the grocery store to buy food. You may have seen, you know, videos or clips of that uh, when that was transpiring. So, so try to get out of debt and raise some cash. There may be, a, you know, some once in a lifetime deal waiting for you on the other side of the bus. And as the dollar becomes more and more worthless, you may see a time like that again. Um, I think having a vocational skill will be important in the upcoming years, like being an electrician, plumber, farmer, carpenter, machinist. Things that people need or and AI and robotics will not be able to do. So if you're young and you may, you know, getting a skill in an overpriced worthless degree somewhere. I know you've talked about getting heirloom seeds. You know, make a garden, grow some of your own food. Maybe it would be wise to do some prepping, store some food, have some water supplies. Uh, Sorry, you're breaking up again. Um, Maybe it would be wise to do some prepping, mm -hmm. store some food, have some, you know, have a water supply, uh, a way to keep warm if you don't have any heat. 
and electrical, you know, and the electrical grid goes down. And, and again, I keep rehashing this, but I think uh, being out of, you know, debt will be a huge advantage going forward. And again, may help you afford some opportunities when the market goes bust. I mean, like you said, you don't have to go crazy, but um, but when you can, think about the worst case scenario and see if there's anything you can do to prepare. And that's about it, John. It's pretty much what I said last time. Talk, but I, I think it's really important that we re re we review it again. Um, so um, thanks for letting me share my forecast with you and your listeners. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing and the time. I'm sorry we've had some obviously technical difficulties we can't control, uh, but we're just trying to be <clears throat> get the most amount of people to hear this and hear it with clarity. Uh, I, the one thing I would say be to everything you said, shared, I think this is important to drive home to the audience, two things. Firstly, B's forecast, as he said himself, is not etched in stone. But what, what, I, what I really want to impress upon you, and I'm sure he would agree, is that these are mutually exclusive events. He, he, he just told you earlier that countries are getting away from the dollar. We know the BRICS is the most prominent example with over 160 nations and growing over 80, as I always say, over 80% of the world's population duly represented. So they're gonna, cut, they're gonna get rid of the dollar, plain and simple. You're in the right place with the currencies, the cryptos, the metals, all these other things. These two scenarios of, of the reset, and yes, that includes Nassar and debt forgiveness. You already heard President Trump talking about it. And you know, no taxes, no taxes on tips, no tax on overtime. He's even told you he's flirting with getting rid of property and income tax, because as I've proven to you folks in my own life, it's already happened. The Treasury, the, the Fed is now baked under the Treasury, and now the seal says Treasury and Fed is no longer there. I've shown you the proof of that time and again, for those of you who've been on our podcast consistently. So understand what he's sharing with you does not denote the reset. They are mutually exclusive items. So do not need to get fear-based or concerned at, oh no, we're in trouble. No, no, you're in the right place. He's giving you what he sees, the 30 to 50,000 foot view. And I'm, I'm going back to the slide for visual posterity, of course, be as you can tell. Uh, what he sees in the next five years. And I've told you folks that what we see happening as a team is it's very much of a biblical Joseph moment where we're going to have this period of wealth, you know, the, the season of the harvest of the plenty for the next five years. And then we will have a season of attrition or uh, uh, a barrenness and lack. And that's what he's alluding to. So he's, he's just basically showing you the patterns that we're being given time to get out of the old system get in the right one and protect ourselves and 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 thrive as the one percent of the population did in the 1929 depression right and then two you know yeah i know something you say what about nasara yeah that's still happening that's not his core concentration that's more of what we do on this side right he's looking at the analytical market side and he's a contrarian by the way because if he weren't, he wouldn't be on this podcast. He would be going with the herd who doesn't see any of this happening. These are the same folks he works with day in and day out who look at the market. It, it would be like two people looking at a painting in a museum. And one person says, I see this. And the other person says, oh, I see this, right? It's the same painting, but two totally different perspectives as an analogy. He's on our side that because uh, he owns a lot of the same stuff we do. So he, he's on our side. He's just telling you, hey, Here's the worst case scenario. Here's where it's most likely headed. Stay the course of where you are and keep, you know, keep taking advantage of the harvest before this time comes. So don't walk away from this thinking, oh no, we're gonna have the dollar. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get our reset. They're, they're, they're two mutually exclusive things. So again, to recap, he's talked about the US stock market blow off or the melt up, the global deflationary bust, stock market losing 80, 90%. Massive global central banks cutting interest rates, trying to print, which is just killing the old system, which is what we're getting out of. A short market rally followed by high inflation. What we know is they drop the interest rates, folks, that's going to weaken the dollar and pump up the market. Just because they pump up the market doesn't make the economy good. It's a lot like a bodybuilder on steroids. It looks good on the outside, but they're dying on the inside, their organs. Same, same thing. Bear market in stocks. 
the ensuing commodity super cycle. We've already talked about that, gold, silver, oil, et cetera. Um, and I think you would agree, B, it's probably not a bad idea, folks, to be looking into certain oil stocks. Um, I can't say all those right now, but, uh, but those of you in the Christian community have a pretty good idea what we're referring to. There are some alternative cheap penny oil stocks you can get into that are going to explode and become the next mobile and Chevron. You can get at the ground floor on that. He's giving you things to ponder and different preparation ideas and solutions. Um, does that sound be like I pretty much accurately covered what you were discussing overall? Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I'm again, I'm looking at it from the, the debt based currency uh, Keynesian model is right. what we're the, the thing that we're in. You're talking about the system that's going to come in and replace it. And so, yeah, talking about the what? I'm sorry. Um, you're, you're talking about uh, the system that's going to come in and replace it. Correct. And so there's that delineation of what we currently have and how it's going to play out. And then, you, you know, your system with XRP, currencies reset, um, Nassara, you know, Nassara, Jassara will be what replaces that. But if, if, if you're in the current system, this is how I think it's going to play out um, as far as just again, from looking at it from just the status quo. And so, um, again, it's it's something that, you know, is probably going to come to fruition, but your listeners shouldn't be afraid about, because we do have some time, and, uh, you know, your the new system should replace the old, mm -hmm. and uh, anybody that's done preparation with the things that you've recommended should, you know, hopefully do very well. Yeah, and it's a very important point you just made be for everybody that <clears throat> it, this is a, a before and after scenario. He, you know, he's talking about the before, what we're in now. And obviously, I always talk about what we're going into, where we're headed. He's showing you ways to capitalize in the Red Sea moment to get a clearer path, to walk through it with more confidence, knowing the roadmap ahead that a higher level helps you to... Um, you know, make those preparations because it isn't just about going and exchanging the currency and that's it. No, I'm, well, I mean, for some of you, it might be that, that you might be satisfied with just exchanging your dinar, exchanging your dong, and you're good. And that's fine. If that's, if that's the, the roadway you're on and that's all you need, okay. Some of us, though, are willing and wanting to go down the rabbit hole and, and, and maximize every possible um, round of wealth transfer that we can. So everybody here is at a different place, regardless of whether you're, uh, you're just doing it at a, at a micro level or a macro level in terms of your wealth. That's why I always say, think about folks, what's your wealth tolerance? You know, what can you handle? Some people, you know, a million dollars is a lot of money, some 10 million, some 100 million, some a billion, and on and on. It just depends on, in the Christian world, we talk about it as the fold. Some are contending for the fivefold. Some of us are contending for the hundredfold. And that's okay. But regardless of wherever lane you're in, if you know where the end from the beginning is, it's going to help you give you peace and confidence and calm and position yourself whichever direction you're in. You now know how to navigate. He's giving you the worst case scenario, and I'm giving you the best case scenario. And you know, you, you can kind of veer in the middle in that transition uh, so that you can take advantage of it. And I really, I really pray that the older faction of this audience that is in debt or is concerned that they don't have any of this stuff. Don't be concerned. People will help you. Some of us have plans to already help you in the works, as I said before. And again, we've given you some very practical, inexpensive solutions to transition your way through. If you really are you know, listening and processing this information and you really want to proactively, if you're actually trying to make the change, you just don't know where to go. This, we believe, is a really worthy and quality uh, you know, on ramp to getting there, and it doesn't cost you much. It's just, it's just making some transitions in your life that are simple, easy things you can do if you're really, you know, genuinely wanting to go in this direction. This can give you a pathway or one of the pathways to do that. And B, I really appreciate your time, brother. I know you got other things to do, and, I, and this is a sacrifice. Thank you for, you know, all you've done all these years with me personally, and what you're doing for the audience. Um, fortunately, you won't have to worry about where people can contact you, so you don't have to give that information. But uh, uh, it, it is really fascinating to see the charts that you did last year, how they're aligning. So before we go, I want the audience to hear this from you and not from me. 
Would it be fair to say as a sort of final summation or thesis, if you will, would it be reasonable to conclude that now that we're going, we're days away from the fourth quarter or the first quarter, or the fiscal year, depending on how you want to look at it, would it be reasonable to conclude based on historical replication, based on what the charts are seeing, and based on what your instincts are on those said items, that most people could reasonably expect by early fourth quarter to see breakthrough and continue at that into the first quarter of next year? I, I do. I, I, I absolutely do. I think this melt up um, is close to hitting its parabolic phase. And uh, I think that could play out. It could be done before the election. So we may be, you know, rolling over and going into the bust by the end of the year, early first quarter. So, um, yeah, I think your timetable is um, is right, is dead on. Thank you. Um, last point to, to reprise what you said about the S and P 500. Um, it's been your contention that if it hits 7,000 or higher, we should definitely see a bust. And I think you told me offline, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, excuse me, that you thought that there's a pretty plausible chance that that could happen before the end of October. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think it'll, like, you know, could very well happen. Um, October, the end of October is pretty aggressive, but it could happen. Um, I'm thinking it'll be closer to the end of the year, but um, when we get going into this parabolic stage, I think it'll be uh, kind of breathtaking. Um, you, you'll see advances like you've never seen before. So mm -hmm. it could play out very, you know, fast, or you know, it, it could linger till the till the end of the till the end of the year. That's my personal opinion. Um, but we're definitely closing in on it. That's for sure. Okay. Well, that's all we can ask. B, thanks for being on the podcast. As always, brother, we appreciate you and um, have a blessed rest of your day. Thanks again. You too. Thanks, John. Bye-bye.